All right, so chapter one, the cell is a unit of health and disease. This is just meant as an introductory lecture to the Robbins Pathology book, which everyone I'm assuming will be using to study and learn about uh, pathology for their program. This is sort of my take on what I thought was most important or the things that I focused on while I was studying. And I think these, these points that I've taken from the textbook will be helpful for you. So without further ado, let's get into it. This is the first chapter which covers just generally speaking, what is pathology? Uh, it goes over the genome itself and, and why that's significant. And then it covers a lot of things about the cell itself. And in this video, we're just going to cover these first two points. And in a following video, we will touch on the cell and wrap up chapter one. So first off, what is pathology? So this chapter touches a lot on some very basic definitions and if you're familiar with medicine at all there are a lot of kind of complicated words and definitions that you'll have to understand and, and memorize and I would encourage all of you to try to understand uh, as opposed to memorize as much as possible because often the roots for these words are often based on Latin and Greek and, and knowing those roots can actually help you understand words and names versus just memorizing a word you might not fully understand and that will help you remember it down the line. So this pathos um, originally translates into suffering and logos is study. So pathology literally translates into the study of suffering. In today's terms, though, it's been appropriated to be the study of disease itself. Now, Virchow, several hundred years ago, coined this term of cellular pathology. Now, is that just the cellular study of suffering? Well, no. <laughs> uh, it's actually just made to emphasize that all disease is actually originating at the cellular level. So there's something going on with our actual cells uh, compared to their normal cellular anatomy or normal or function something is going on at that level and is causing a change which is then causing the changes that we're seeing with our eyes the macroscopic changes the disease state that's actually affecting the people and that is what we are seeing uh, as an end result from this cell cellular pathology the genome is composed of about 3.2 billion base pairs. It's a ton. And these base pairs are just combinations of four of the basic nucleotides that you probably learned about in biology. These are the adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, or A, T, C, and G. And if you, um, if you recall, the A's and the T's bond together, and they are a single base pair. And the C and the G's pair together, that is another base pair. If you can't remember that, just tell yourself the tall letters go together, the A and the T, and the curvy letters also go together, that's the C and the G. And when you're using RNA, the C, G, and U are all the curvy letters. So this genome that we have in all our cells is 3.2 billion base pairs, so combinations of those. And actually only about 20,000 of that 3.2 billion, or 1.5% are actually protein encoding genes. And these proteins are going to be things that we have in our body, like um, enzymes, any structural components, so the things that actually create the physical form of your body, as well as signaling molecules themselves. Now, that's a lot of that's a lot of unused genes. That's you know I'm not great at math, but 3.2 billion minus 20,000. There's still something like 3.1 billion plus um, base pairs that are left over. So, what are these leftover? base pairs actually doing. Now, now we may look at these protein encoding genes and compare them to another species, say the glorious worm. And it turns out that worms actually have the same number of approximate, the same approximate number of protein encoding genes that we do. And remember, those are the genes that are building everything that we have in our bodies. But comparatively, their genome is only about 0.1 billion base pairs long, so a way, way less. So there's an extra 3.1 billion base pairs or so that we have that are doing something. So, you know, we're not quite worms. 
and people have discovered that up to about 80% of the genome has some kind of functional activity and that functional activity is mostly related to gene activity or basically controlling those other 20,000 that, that actually make stuff. So you could think of the genome as a protein coding, a protein coding component and these make the these are the building blocks and machinery for making cells and tissues so that's kind of the the bricks the wood the stone the drywall the insulation for actually building our bodies and connecting everything together and then there's this much larger non-coding region and those are the blueprints and instructions themselves and that uh, that's what's telling our cells you know which cells to build where how to build them and that's is actually what's differentiating us from the worms now within these non-coding sequences there are four main classes of these non-coding sequences and these uh, you can see here listed below the promoters and enhancers it's you know as it sounds these are going to promote activity um, within a, a coding region elsewhere within the genome there are binding sites so these are helping to organize and maintain higher order chromatin structures the regulatory RNAs, these are uh, microRNAs and long non-coding RNAs. We'll talk about these in a little bit, but these are actually regulating the translation of genes. And there are also some special structures, and these are things like telomeres and centromeres, so the very ends of your chromosomes and the, the tether points within the center of your chromosomes. There are a couple ways that your DNA can actually vary within the genome, and these are these single nucleotide polymorphisms and the copy number variations. So these single nucleotide variations are literally just one, uh, one nucleotide has been swapped out or changed. So instead of having a C um, as is normal here, it's been it's been switched to a T on the left, as you can see. Now, only about one percent of these are occurring in coding regions, and this is actually about the same as what you would expect with chance. So, this isn't a, this isn't a significant contribution to variations within the genetic sequence. And when you compare these to the rate of actual disease in people, uh, these are sometimes a marker for disease. Like sometimes these will occur alongside a type of disease, but the direct effect of most of these, it has pretty weak disease susceptibility. Now the copy number variations, on the other hand, instead of being just a single nucleotide, so an A or a T or a C or a G that has been swapped, these are actually variations in large contiguous stretches of DNA. And these can range from thousands of base pairs to millions of base pairs long. And this is basically when a section of the genome is repeated and the number of these, key, these repeats or copies of that particular gene uh, will actually vary between people as well. Now, sometimes these are just simple duplications uh, or even deletions within the genome, but other times these can be pretty complex rearrangements of the gene material itself. Um, more of these include gene coding sequences. So those SNPs, the single nucleotide variations, only about 1% occurred in coding regions, but for the CNVs, about 50% of these are actually in those gene coding sequences. So these actually may underlie a larger portion of the phenotypic diversity that, uh, that you see. And just recall that the phenotype is actually what you see when the genes are expressed, while the genotype is the, the actual genetic information itself. Now all that said, uh, not much is known about either of these, so this is still an evolving field within the study of genomics. So another thing that is mentioned in the textbook is the histone. Now these histones are something that are a, a structural component or kind of a, a scaffolding or a framework for the storage of your genetic material. Um, now all of the all of the cells in your body they have the same genetic material. Um, whether you take a, a cell from your, you know, from your, the skin on your arm or from inside your body, the genetic material is all the same, but obviously the cells that you're actually taking them from have pretty distinct structures and, and functions to themselves. You know, your skin cell on the outside of your body is different than a bone cell, different from a muscle cell, different from a cell on the inside of your GI tract. So there's something that is telling all these cells 
to you know to behave differently or to use a different part of the genetic information that exists to create that specific terminal um, terminal type of cell so this we know is not something that's based solely on the genetics because all these cells have the same types of genes but it is actually something that uh, that is above the genetics or is an epigenetic factor and that is something that's not based on just the order of the the base pairs now histones are one of these types of things that have have to do with the i guess varying expression of genes now a histone itself is a is a protein in which the dna is wrapped really tightly around and this is the actual scaffolding that uh, that they exist in now dna if it was stretched out has an unwound length of about 1.8 meters which is huge and keep in mind that's within every single cell in your body but once they're coiled around these histones and wrapped up within your cells, they're only, all that genetic information can be stored within a cell that's only about seven or eight micrometers in diameter. So that's a huge amount of compression that occurs here. Um, now, if you look at this, this little image on the left, the, that top one, they almost kind of look like Oreos or, um, you know, a connect four board stacked tightly on top of each other. And then below that, they almost look like sort of a, a bead of, of pearls with the yellowy, um, the yellow histones containing genetic material. And then there's stretches of DNA that are exposed, which is kind of like the, the portion of the necklace cord. If you're envisioning that as a beaded necklace, and those are parts of the DNA that is actually available for transcription and translation. So it's these portions and which part is actually open and available for transcription and translation and which parts are condensed and not available that actually has a big role to play on the you know the epigenetics and the actual final expression of these cells now when histones are in this compact form it's referred to as heterochromatin these are basically wound up transcriptionally inactive and when it's unwound like on the bottom these are transcriptionally active and are called u-chromatin and i like to think that it's u-chromatin because it's usable kind of corny but it works and not to go too in depth on this but these histones can be modified by additional things like acetylation methylation and phosphorylation and these are things that are going to open up the chromatin so they're changing the histones from a heterochromatin to a euchromatin. They can influence things like transcriptional activation or influence uh, transcriptional repression. And they can also condense the chromatin. So changing it from a euchromatin into a heterochromatin. Now, another thing that we will go over are just these segments of non-coding RNAs. And these are the micro RNAs and the long non-coding RNAs. Uh, just recall that this was one of the um, kind of main classes of the non-coding sequences of, of uh, within your DNA. So as I said, these are both non-coding molecules and they actually don't produce a protein. So they'll get transcribed, but the translation into a protein, that portion doesn't actually occur. So there's still a type of RNA floating around your cell. And the first one we are gonna look at is the microRNA. So these micro mRNAs or the miRNAs, these, uh, there's actually not a ton of these relative to the amount of protein encoding genes that exist in your cells. So we said there was about 20,000 protein encoding genes. There's only about, you know, 1,000 or so of these micro RNAs. And that's, uh, that's about a 20 fold less difference. Now, these mature micro RNAs, once they get basically produced, um, they're transcribed and sent out into your cell. They, they'll actually regulate multiple genes. So you don't need a kind of a one-for-one -one relationship with the protein encoding genes. Once the microRNAs are uh, combined within your cells with these RISC complexes, they can actually act on mRNA um, that is destined to actually become protein. So other RNA molecules and they can block either the translation, so they're gonna stop that RNA from being turned into a protein and, uh, and just prevent that from happening, or they'll actually cleave the RNA itself, and that can also prevent protein 
uh, protein translation. These, uh, on the other hand, these long non-coding RNAs, uh, there's, a, there's way more of them relative to, the, to those micro RNAs. So 10 to 20,000 of them. So this is almost the same number of protein encoding genes that are available. And there's a fair number of ways that they will actually modulate, modulate gene expression. Um, so they can you know, activate, suppress, modify the chromatin and facilitate. Some of the ways that they will go about doing this is they can, they can physically bind to the chromatin itself, which is gonna restrict RNA polymer polymerase access to the genes in this region. And just recall that the RNA polymerase is the main sort of transcription gene of choice. They can also uh, facilitate transcription factor binding. This is something, uh, again, that's going to activate genes. Uh, they can suppress genes by, on the flip side, they'll bind transcription factors, so they're gonna block transcription. There's other chromatin modifications that can take place. So the histone modification by acetylation or methylation that we just talked about, uh, those can open or close the histones and make you know, the DNA actually available for transcription and translation. And they may actually act as a scaffolding to stabilize secondary or tertiary molecules that again, have a role to play in transcription and translation. So this is just gonna cap off the first part of this video. And in the second part, we're just gonna take a look at the cell, review some internal structures, go over the metabolism, signaling and activation, and touch on how cells renew themselves. Thanks, and I'll see you guys in the next video.